Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Schmidt. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome. I am Susan. You are in my studio, Stitched by Susan. Today's episode of Live and Unscripted is a quilting reality show. I'm going to be loading up a baby quilt, quilting it, and then attaching binding to it on the long arm. So if you've never seen that done or never thought that it was possible, this could be an eye opener for you. So it is a small project, it is a baby quilt, so that we get through the quilting part fairly quickly and get onto that binding. I don't want it to get too, too long, but I want you to be able to see the binding. So for those of you who may be new, Live and Unscripted is a live streaming episode where um, it's not edited. It is literally in real time. So you get to see me working through the whole process of a quilt and I just, it's not a lesson. I just kind of chat as I'm working about the decisions that I'm making and the choices, um, maybe even the challenges that are in the particular quilt. And today, a couple of topics, the binding being one of them. And so you just get to see that whole thing in real time. It's the kind of thing I wish I'd had when I was a beginner quilter because there's so much about the daily decision making process that like you just don't know when you're beginning and you never stand alongside someone else working at their long arm, right? Or go to each other's house carrying your long arm in your purse. So you don't get to see these things in action. So I hope that this show will do that for you. And as I said, it's not really a lesson. So don't necessarily expect instruction in the design that I'm quilting, but it just gives you a chance to look over my shoulder while I'm working on a whole project. So we do try and air these two Fridays a month. That's always our goal. I believe in November we only did one, but the good news for you today is the 1st of December. We're going to do it again next Friday on the 8th of December. And spoiler alert, we have a big announcement that we hope to be able to make next Friday. We've been working on something big in the background. Um, it's a collaboration with some other wonderful quilters. So hopefully that will be coming your way next Friday and I'll have more information on that. Take note of the kind of music we're playing. Just say, okay. Couple more things before we dive right in. A few thanks are due. Um, our son, Will, who does the voices on the various introductions that we do at the beginning of the show. My husband, Dave, who I call Mr. Producer. There he is. Um, so he's he's the one that keeps all the, all the things in the air and juggling and going, right? All the cameras and so forth. So huge appreciation for that. And then our good friend, Dan Unger, who allows us to use his music on our show. So the lovely guitar music that you hear throughout is from Dan Unger. So thanks, Dan, for that. Um, and a couple of other places that you can find me. I'm just going to set down my coffee. Big stretch. A couple other places you can find me if you're interested in more quilting content. Obviously, I'm on Facebook and Instagram social media, but I also have a podcast called Measure Twice, Cut Once, and Other Life Lessons Learned from Quilters. So you can find that wherever podcasts are found, and also it is now on YouTube. You can just look for a podcast playlist, and I'm in the process of loading all the episodes up there so that you can watch them, and there are transcripts there as well, so you can read them if that's easier for you. Um, working along through them. What else did I need to talk about? Ah, Mr. Producer is, is saying we apologize for the little buzz that's in the background. It is snowing today and there's a snowblower working out on our sidewalk. So we have no control over that. So sorry about that buzz. It'll probably stop um, fairly soon. I've set my coffee down already, but I did want to say one thing. YouTube, as always, is free content. Always. You just have to pay by watching the ads. But if you want to support my show, you can do that easily at buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. You can contribute as little as $5 one time, or you can sign up for a monthly contribution. Either way, every dollar that comes there, we pour into upgrading our equipment. So if you look back even three months ago, our lighting has changed drastically. Our cameras have changed. Um, the camera that Mr. Producer is on today is really cool. It actually tracks him. So when he moves, that camera follows him. And hopefully this will help me in the future be able to video myself. See how cool that is? It makes you a little dizzy. But the, the goal is that it will help me to be able to video myself a little more and produce a little more video content and not be dependent on when he's home from his job. Okay, is that all the basics? I think so. Let's get started quilting. Okay. 
we've got this little piece of backing here. It's orange with little triangular dots. And I did mention it's a very tiny quilt, little tiny baby quilt. This is just a width of fabric. So I've got a selvage on this end facing me and a selvage on that end. So that's what I've chosen for my top and bottom to make it really easy to load. I'm using the red snapper system. So there's a little red rod inside this hem. And then my clamp here just snaps on over top of it. And you notice that I do not center my quilt. I don't mark the center point of the fabric. I don't necessarily load it in the center of my long arm frame. All that's important is that I have a straight edge on this edge that's facing me. And then from there, I've just tossed the excess fabric over the back of the long arm rail. And I'm going to go around to the other side and pull it smooth. And then we'll snap it on on that side. And the, the act of rolling it up is what pulls it on straight. And that's why I don't have to center it in any way um, because it doesn't really matter where it is on the long arm frame. It just matters that it ends up square. So having this straight edge on first and then pulling it on straight with the grain is what keeps it square. So I want to watch that I don't have any, do you see these angled lines here? When I pull this off to one side or the other, even half an inch that happens. So I do have to make sure this is straight over the long arm rail. It's super easy with this tiny quilt. With bigger ones, sometimes you have to fiddle with it just a little to keep it straight or adjust it a time or two as you're rolling it on. It's so little that it's pulling, it's pulling right off the rail. So I'm just going to use an extra magnet as a kind of clip there to hold it in place. As I work, you are welcome to type in any questions or comments, but if you do have a question, we ask that you put two Q's in front of it, QQ. That enables Dave to search for them. If you just do one Q, it pulls up the word quilt or quilting, as you can imagine, over and over and over again. So put two Q's, QQ. And that way we'll be able to come back to the questions at any point. Okay, backing is loaded. There we go, nice and straight. Grab my batting. Today I'm using Hobbs 80-20 batting. The 80% is cotton, the 20% is polyester. It's a good all-purpose batting. And often for baby quilts, you can see me picking threads off. Often for baby quilts, I'm using something that was trimmed off, maybe beside a lap quilt. Just trying to make the best use of my batting. But that's why it has a few colored threads stuck to it. It's already been against a quilt before. I think, you guys, I'm going to make one quick change here. It, I find that if my batting is wider than my backing, that it gets caught up in the, the wheels of the long arm sometimes or gets in my way. So I'm going to walk out of camera a minute and get my scissors. And I'm just going to trim a few inches off that batting so it doesn't extend beyond. And I actually think I have enough batting here for two baby quilts, so I'm only going to trim half of it narrower. You'll see what I'm doing in just a second here as I come up over the top. And this way I can see, too, to put my uh, clips on on the side, which if my batting hangs over, that's difficult to see. Perfect. And this is our little baby quilt. This is for my friend Pris. And I see... Hmm. I'm thinking here, you guys. I wonder if... She's got top marked here, and the backing is not directional, but I'm just going to have a quick look at this. 
I had it laid out flat on the floor, but clearly I lost my orientation because my quilt now is wider than my backing, so I may have to reload that backing. I do. Okay. See, it's, it's a reality show. This is what I'm saying. So the backing actually needs to be turned 90 degrees because it's a little longer this way and my quilt is a little wider than it is long. So bear with me. We'll just quickly redo that. This is a test of how fast I can do it. And by the way, depending on your quilting design, you could just proceed with it this way. I could have just turned the quilt top. Some of you may be wondering why I'm not doing that. The reason I'm not is because the quilting design I've chosen is directional. It's going to be bubbles and waves, so I want it to go from side to side of the quilt. So I can't load the quilt turn sideways. Otherwise I would do that. This is how quilting goes sometimes. But it does pay to kind of think through it twice. Double check before you start laying down stitches. So again, I'm just having a look at my fabric to make sure this front edge is straight. And it is, so I'm good to go there. Whoops, dropped it. What I feel like you have to watch out for when you don't have a selvage on this edge, it's all too easy to stretch it out a little bit. Oh, I'm struggling now. <laughs> this is hilarious. Okay, come back here. It's all too easy to stretch it out a little bit, so I'm trying to be very gentle with the fabric, and I had this first little bit clamped, but obviously not enough because it came loose. There we go. So I'm just watching that I neither have fullness pushed in nor have my fabric stretched out underneath this C-clamp. And you can usually see that by looking at the fabric below it. Is it stretched out or is it easing in? And I've just worked with a lot of fabric over the years and so I feel comfortable by guessing and by goshing that some may want to pin and be more precise about the process than I am. This is a very small quilt backing. Very small. It's going to be a little quilt. nice and smooth. Generally, I would be watching here too because sometimes, sometimes the selvage edges tend to pull a little bit tighter along this outside edge. This one seems nice and flat, but if it were pulling, I would literally take a scissors and snip every so often just to let that relax so it doesn't pull up those side edges too much. Well, you've gotten a good look at the loading process today, times two. Okay, we're loaded up again. Okay, apparently we have some questions about the loading process. Let's take those. And now, by the way, I flipped my batting around. So the end that I trimmed is down there. It's going to be for the next tiny baby quilt. And the end that I did not trim is up here because now I need it to be a touch wider. Okay, let's see a question. I'm sorry I missed that. 
Juliana, do you do your leaders stretch out unevenly over time? I use the middle of the leaders with smaller quilts more than the edges. Mine have not done that, Juliana. Of course, this machine is fairly new, but on one of my gamels, I did 750 quilts on it and never changed the leaders out. So I did not find that they stretched. However, some leaders might be made of different fabrics and that might respond differently. That's just been my experience. And something, I know you buy 120 inch wide batting. Where do you purchase it from? Um, I'm fortunate to have a long arm quilting supply store in my town and so that's where I get it. Uh, there are some batting supply places, uh, Quilter's Dream being one of them, that will ship directly to consumers and so that's an option too. And sometimes the big box stores like Joann's will sell rolls of batting. Um, Sometimes your shipping costs involved, but usually you can get the batting at a good price. I was starting to say earlier when I got sidetracked over the orientation of the quilt, my friend Pris is very good about putting top wherever the top of the quilt is, which in this case was really helpful because it is wider than it is long. And I would not necessarily have figured that out on my own, right? I would have been apt to turn the quilt and then these stripes that are on it, which you now can't see, but you will as soon as I start quilting. She wants them to run horizontally and I might have run them vertically, right? So just a note to those who are um, sending their quilts to long armors or for you who long arm for other people, pass on to your folks. Put notes on just as simple as top. That's all you need. It can really avoid costly errors. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Do your red snappers slide under the dead bar? They do, Jean, and typically what I do is where the snap portion is, the thicker portion, I move my machine a little to the left of that, and so that thin inner portion is all that has to slide under the dead bar, and it works fine. Jackie, where did you get the magnets from? Uh, Mr. Producer is going to post a link for you, just our local hardware store. They're nothing fancy. They're just the kind that you would put in a shop for tools. Um, I think he'll put an Amazon link up because everyone's got access to that. Um, so there you go. Linda Gosselin, I quilt barefoot too. <laughs> Love your channel. I know. I just somehow I can't quilt or sew as well with shoes on. <laughs> it's funny. Kim, hello from Massachusetts. Have you seen the Ember Smart Mug? Keeps your coffee at a constant temperature. I have, Kim. I just have not sprung for it. It is, it is not inexpensive, but you know, maybe it'll be in my stocking this year. That's a subtle hint, isn't it? <laughs> okay, is that the last of the questions? All right. Okay, let's start quilting, you guys. So this process is the same pretty much for every quilt I do, and that is to base the perimeter of it. And I based usually up the left side, across the top, and down the right side. If you've been taught to baste bottom up every time, there's no need to change that necessarily. But if you're comfortable enough with your fabric and knowing that you can keep it flat and straight and where you want it to be, you also don't have to quilt bottom up. The reason for that is it kind of helps you manage any fullness um, so it doesn't get stretched, the fabric doesn't get stretched. But there are other ways to manage fullness too, right? So I opt for efficiency up the left, across the top, down the right. On bigger quilts I usually turn my channel lock on so I get a really nice straight line across the top. On this small quilt I just lined it up visually with my red snappers and I'm eyeballing it. But that's just me, you do you. And I'm just pushing the fabric a little bit under the hopper foot. I find consistently that if I don't do anything, the fabric will push out in front of the hopper foot. So I either tuck it in under this way or I pull it from behind or I use my thumbnail behind. Um, just because of where my camera is located today, it's difficult for me to reach in behind. So I'm tucking it from in front. But any of the above ways work. It just is important that you don't let your fabric be pushing down in front of you. Okay, now we've got basting in place. 
I should give you a few more um, details. I'm quilting on a Bernina Q24. Her name is Stella. And I'm using isocord thread, 100% polyester, uh, 40 weight thread in an aqua color. And typically when I quilt, which camera am I on, hon? The side one would be good. Typically when I quilt, I put clamps on the sides of my quilt to hold hold this a little bit taut. Today I'm not because I don't have very much excess uh, fabric here. And when you're working on a very small quilt, it's usually quite manageable to do it without those side clamps. So that's not always an answer. And if you're having trouble with wrinkling backs, clamping is your friend. But I'm pretty confident in this one. I've got everything smooth and in place and I think it's gonna be okay. So I'm gonna quilt a design that I call Waves and Bubbles. You'll see why. And I'm just gonna start by freehanding in the first row of bubbles at the top. So that established my row, if you will. And now I'm going across again above it and quilting another row of waves. But as you can see, I'm kind of chopping them off at the top. So I find it easier to do the first full line first and then to follow it with this echo. And then we'll proceed on into the bubble portion. You can see that the fabric is this, it's zoo creatures, but they're a little bit cartoonish, a little bit whimsical. So I thought these waves and bubbles are a good choice of design, a little bit playful, youthful, etc. Chris, whose quilt this is, makes quite a lot of baby quilts for her local NICU. And she actually has a little organization and she calls it We Ones Quilts. And she supplies the NICU and so do other quilters that work with her, but Chris is kind of at the helm. She supplies her local NICU with all these little quilts. When I'm doing a design like this where it's all too easy to, much like handwriting, either run continually uphill with it or run continually downhill with it, I find it really helpful to have some sort of guideline. So at the top edge of this quilt and also at the bottom, I've got this orange stripe that Pris put in. So I'm using that kind of out of the corner of my eye. I'm keeping an eye on that stripe and keeping my waves lined up with it. As I get past that, I'll show you my favorite tool. I bet those of you who are regular watchers are gonna be able to guess it, um, just for keeping those wavy lines, more or less, running straight across the quilt.
And here I'm really using it. I'm making my bubbles pretty much fill up that orange line. So now I'll know this row is nice and straight. And now for the magical tool. Here's my magical tool. Blue painter's tape. I love this stuff. Green works too. Mr. Producer is saying everybody called it. I'm sure you did because many of you know me. This is a tool that is so helpful in so many ways. Because it's usually a different color than the quilt, your eye can see this without even really stopping to look at it, right? So it's just a great visual guide to keep you on track. And if you need to put it closer and move it each time, you can do that and restick it as many times as you want to. I'm going to go down there with it. Designs like this, by the way, are absolutely wonderful for advancing your quilting skill. If you quilt a whole quilt like this with bubbles and all the bubbles you're thinking about making them as round and consistent as you possibly can, you will quilt bubbles by the end of it better. And I am in stitch regulated mode now, meaning I've got my stitch length set at 10 stitches per inch and my machine is regulating. I'll try and make it change a bit. Can you hear it speed up when I go faster? And it's trying to regulate my stitch length to keep it at 10. But what I'm practicing, focusing on, is keeping my stitching speed smooth. So that, how do I say it? Instead of zooming around a circle like this and then zooming around a wave and then zooming around a circle, I try and keep a consistent, even stitching speed and this means I am in full control of my machine. And this too, I think is really helpful in being more skillful in your control levels at your quilting machine. So even though that stitch regulator is there working for you, use the sound of it as a tool. Strive to get an even smooth sound. see how we did as we get down closer to the tape. Oops, my thread just broke. Let me check if I'm out of bobbin thread. I don't think so. Those of you who are regulars know my rule of thumb here. When I have one thread break, it sometimes just happens. So I'll just re-thread and keep going. If I have two thread breaks, then I will start looking deeper. I'm struggling with the needle threader. There we go. Fortunately, it broke right at the edge. So I've only got about an inch and a half of stitching to undo. If that had not happened, I would have just undone till a place where I thought the stitching was unobtrusive, like hidden in a print piece or at the top of the circle where it backtracks a little bit, something like that. And that's where I would have started again with a few lock stitches and launched into it. But since I am so close to the edge of the quilt, I'm just going to go ahead and pull it out. There we go. By the way, have I showed you guys my new scissors? There they are. They're by Kai. And can you see they just have a little curved tip, but they're also blunt, which I really appreciate. I've had their small ones before that have a sharp tip, but it just seems to catch on the fabric. And that little blunt tip 
is awesome. I love those little scissors. They're my trimmers that always stay attached to my long arm. So I'm just grabbing both my threads, doing a few lock stitches, and then launching into my next row of waves and bubbles. And I think we're pretty even against the blue painter's tape. And it's pretty easy with this design to just make adjustments if you need to. Space your waves a little bit further apart, make your bubbles a wee bit bigger on the one side. If you find that you've, you know, gone all uphill, you can make an adjustment every so often. And if you do that frequently throughout the quilt, that won't show at all. As opposed to letting it get really out of control and then all of a sudden having, you know, inches worth of difference to make up in the last row. I am going to um, go ahead and break thread. And the reason for this is those red snappers. Someone asked this question earlier, if they fit under my dead bar. And the truth of it is, do we have a side camera that will show this? Can we see that, my snappers at all? Yeah, you can. The snapper part that's over top, actually I can show you here. This part that's over top is quite thick and bulky, but beyond where this part is, my little rod in the hem is much thinner. So all I want to do is be able to move Stella so she's beyond where those clips are while I advance. And it's just that first advance. After that, I often will just leave the needle in and roll the machine with the quilt. And look, there's the end of our quilt already. I'm just thinking here, I might actually back up a little bit just so I can put my magnets on there one more time. Just like so. Okay, I need a smidge of coffee. Let's take a couple questions. I'll move Stella out of the way. Okay, funny one for you. So Mr. Producer is saying he ran a poll asking you all if you preferred the split screen, half and half, or the little screen and the, and the larger one. And he says it's about 50-50. So he's telling us we need a definitive answer so he knows what to do. <laughs> so if you haven't chimed in on that, please do. Because we can do it either way. Makes no difference to us. It's just whatever it looks like for your ease of watching. That's what we want to do. Emily, learning so much watching you. Good deal. I'm so glad. Truly, this is what I wish I'd had when I was a beginner quilter. Kim, I load the same way, but to the back bar first. The excess length is on the front bar and ends up at the bottom of my quilt. If I run short on backing, the extra will be at the bottom where I need it. That does make sense, Kim. I found when I did that, it would always fall off my front and I couldn't keep it in place while I did the clipping, but maybe you have a better method of doing that. There are so many ways to load a quilt, by the way. There's not one right way. You're just seeing my way. Jody's asking, why are there two cones of thread on the machine? This cone, Jody, I've got attached to my bobbin winder, which is right here. Can you see that? So, so I can be winding a bobbin. It's a separate motor entirely. I can turn my bobbin winder on while I'm quilting, and I do that. So I tend to keep two spools of thread of my favorite, most of my colors that I use just so that I don't have to pre-wind my bobbins for a whole quilt. I just wind them as I go. Gail, how steep do you make your waves? When doing this pattern, I either made them too steep or too shallow. Love the pattern. Probably, Gail, it's going to vary much like handwriting. Yours will end up being a little different than mine, but I'll tell you what I'm doing here. I would say my bubbles are about an inch and a half and my waves are about an inch from top to from mountain to valley about oh that's it oh no one more debbie not sure what i do wrong but when i baste my top tends to get all wonky i only notice it when i roll it maybe i should pin it in place before i baste that's a great idea debbie if you're having any when in doubt pin because then you you know where you're at and as you get more comfortable with it maybe space the pins out more even if there's a pin every 16 inches, 
you know when I get to that pin, I've got to have fit all this fabric in, right? Or not stretched all this fabric. So that gives you checkpoints, if you will. Elaine, you always know where you're going. I get lost and then it is yuck. How do you remember where you're at in the design? Just much practice, Elaine. I've done many of these designs many times. Um, I've fiddled around with other things and others and students have too. Things like, for example, if you're using the blue painter's tape as a guideline, you could actually mark where you want your waves to be, how often, and mark it on the blue painter's tape. And that will go down the quilt with you, right? And that can help you. Here's my valley. Here's my valley. Here's my valley, right? So there's different ways that you can manage that if you're not comfortable just winging it the way that I do. Mary Rose. I have a domestic machine. Sometimes the print or the piecing distracts me from the quilting pattern. Is practice the only answer? I think it probably is, Mary Rose. You, you get to a point where you almost don't notice the print of the fabric because you're just, you, you're just seeing the quilting. Um, I'm not sure how well this will work at a domestic, but at my long arm, when I'm finding it really difficult to see, my solution is to turn off all the lights in the room and all the quilting machine lights. And I have a freestanding floor lamp with a, like a gooseneck on it. And I shine it low and to the side right across my quilt. And those shadows is kind of all I see. So then I'm not really seeing the print and the colors and stuff. I'm just seeing the shadows of where my quilting lies. So that's what I do when it's most difficult. Not sure how that will translate at a domestic machine for you. Eleanor, so that's one row of wave alternating with one row of bubbles, right? It's kind of two rows of bubbles and then a solitary wave. So there's the upper bubble and then there's the lower bubble that points upward and then there's just one wave in between. Hope that makes sense. I know it's difficult to see on this print on camera. I know that. Debbie, what keeps the red solo cup from following, falling? Just a magnet. I've got a magnet stuck onto my machine and I've got a magnet between my two cups. And I only have two cups because then I can pull the one out and go dump it at the trash. On my last machine, I actually had glued my cup on there, my bottom cup. And I may do that again because this does drive me nuts when it wobbles, but I didn't like to affix glue to my machi machine till I was sure. Tisha, may I ask what your speed is? Is it regulated or manual? Today I'm working in regulated actually. And so I've got it set, set at 10 stitches per inch. Grant, did I miss it or are you not using the side clamps today? You're right, I'm not using the side clamps, Grant. And that is because I don't have very much excess, like less than two inches on each side of my quilt. So there's not much to grab onto. And being that the quilt is so small and I'm pretty confident that I've got it smooth and there's no pleats going on in the back, I'm trusting to that and I'm pretty sure it's gonna be okay. If I did not think it was going to be okay, I could have either put the side clamps on and then put, you know, my yard sticks or something in there that would really lift them up because they're going to get in the way of my long arm. Or I could have sewed extenders onto that backing, like an extra piece of fabric to clamp. And if it had been a bigger quilt, I probably would have done that. With a very small quilt, it's usually pretty manageable, even if you don't use the clamps, I find. Gwenna, are you doing the binding on this quilt on your machine during this live? Yes, I am. I'm going to attach the binding to the front. So we won't be completing it, but attaching it to the front. Yes. That's it. That's it. Okay. One more sip. Let's get quilting. We're at 60, 40, and 50, 2, 48. It's terrible. Mr. Producer is groaning because he's not getting much... Um, He's getting lots of comments about the view, but not much definitive uh, preferences. It still is pretty close to half and half. I'm sorry, there's a question? What's the width of the quilt? Well, the backing is width of fabric, which is what, 44 or 45? So the quilt must be about 42. I didn't measure it, to be honest. My tape is sticking to me.
I am currently using a quarter inch basting stitch for the basting at the perimeter, but I don't think it really matters what you use. Sometimes I'm lazy and I just don't even change my stitch length for the basting, and I think that's okay. I've heard other quilters say that if you're trying to pull in excess fabric, that the longer half inch or one inch stitches are easier. So I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. You're just trying to hold it in place is all. Isn't this blue guideline fantastic? You guys, seriously, I should have brought shares in the, is it 3M that makes this painter's tape? I use it for so many things in my quilting studio. It's not even funny. Okay, got to see which line I'm at. What's your speed in BSR 1, somebody asked. So apparently someone asked, what's my speed in BSR 1? So BSR means Bernina Stitch Regulator. So I don't set the speed, right? I set the stitches per inch. And the little red lights that you're seeing when I've got the machine turned on, that's the cameras viewing from below. And so now the motor is speeding up and slowing down based on what it's seeing of my fabric moving. So I don't set the speed when I'm in BSR, I set the stitch length. Split screen wins. Apparently the split screen is winning at this point. It's out in the lead. It seems to me that when we did way early on in my YouTube episodes, we kind of were doing one or the other. And it gradually dawned on me that you almost have to have both because you want to see close up. You want to see what's happening, but you need that wider angle view to get the bigger picture, right? To just see how it all comes together. I do know the quilting is tricky to see on this print, but keep in mind, these sessions are not intended to be lessons per se. So they're almost always client quilts. So it's the real thing. I don't choose the fabric based on how well it'll show up on camera. This is just something I'm quilting this week and I invite you in to see it. So sometimes the quilting shows up better than others. But again, it's not really a lesson about the quilting design. It's more about the whole process, the loading, the squaring up, etc. Um, I need to move my tape. It's going to get in the way. I think we're done with tape till we're down below the orange now. Apparently someone has just tuned in and is asking about the blue tape and what it's for. It is just my guideline to keep things on the straight and narrow. So I'm quilting these very wavy lines and bubbles across the width of a quilt. It can be difficult to keep those wavy lines level. It's all too easy to run uphill and to run each row running more uphill. You can shortly have a bit of a mess on your hands. So having that very visible blue painter's tape, and I just move it along as I progress down the quilt. Having that very visible tape um, helps me keep things straight. On some quilts, you've got enough seam lines that those seam lines will do the same thing for you. In this case, I've got a couple of orange stripes here and there. They're helpful. But the entire center of the quilt was just fabric, so I had no real guideline. Blue painter's tape to the rescue.
And now as I'm coming to this orange stripe, I'm going to use it as my visual guideline. And if there are any areas where I see my waves are kind of out of kilter, this is my opportunity to make adjustments. So this particular row of bubbles, you can see, I'm making the bottoms of them pretty much touch that orange line. And I know this row is nice and level. Okay. Let us take off our magnets. We'll advance just a little bit and base the bottom edge. This is indeed a very, very tiny quilt. So we're just about through the quilting already. And this time, because I'm past my red snapper at the top now, I'm just gonna leave needle down in the edge of the quilt, roll the whole thing up. Stella the long arm just comes along for the ride. It's all good. Tiny tip for you. Whenever I'm coming to the end of a quilt, um, I like to grab my leaders and pull them up and actually clip them on both sides. Um, in general, I'm thinking then I'm ready to set up my next quilt. For today's purposes, we're going to go back and forth a bit with the binding. But when you're working with a small quilt, it's helpful too, because if these leaders are pulling like this, it is stretching your fabric underneath, I guarantee you. So take steps to lessen that pull, that awkward pull, if you see that happening anywhere on the quilt. Let's put basting on. I am going to walk around the machine and put my channel lock on. I should have done this at the top. If I'm thinking ahead, right, I can think to myself, if I put this channel lock on and have a perfectly horizontal line, that can really help me when I'm basting my binding on or sewing my binding on. I didn't do it across the top, so I might have to use my ruler up there. Because even if your fabric is a few threads off, you can imagine when you're sewing a quarter inch seam on that binding, um, just a few threads off makes a big difference. Just bar barely catching this. I'm going to move up half a stitch. There we go. Much better. You'll see what I mean in a few minutes when we get to the, the binding. Again, there's umpteen different ways to do the binding. You'll get to see my way. And also, my disclaimer here, I... I typically don't put my binding on on the long arm. I've got such a good system set up at my sewing machine that that's my preference. I've got lots of table room and I exactly know my uh, seam allowance width and I always cut my binding the same width and so forth. Um, but this is an option and for some people it's a very good option. You know, if you've got shoulders that give you grief sometimes or those sorts of things, this can be a really good option. All right, just a few more rows. I was talking earlier, but it kind of bears repeating. Designs like this are such a great opportunity for practicing your quilting skill, practicing your control specifically. So I do have my stitch regulator on. So my machine is regulating the motor speed to achieve a consistent stitch length for me. So listen to this when I go more quickly around a circle. Can you hear the motor speed up or around a wave or around a circle? So it's making every effort to regulate my stitch length. But if I pay attention to the sound of that motor and make every effort to keep it smooth and evenly paced, that really shows that I'm in control of my machine at every second. I'm not relying on centrifugal force to swing around those circles and waves, right? I am in control. 
that's how you know you're the one making the nice round bubbles. And a whole quilt of bubbles like this will go a long way towards helping you make round circles. But it is important that you don't just swing your way through it. Um, because it's possible to do circles upon circles upon circles and never get better. But it's also possible to really focus on them. Getting them as round as you can and consistent as you can. And they'll just get better and better. Okay, there's a question, sorry. Somebody asked if that was supposed to be a wave with no bubbles. Someone asked if it was supposed to be a wave with no bubbles. Let's see. Yes, you guys are right. In my talking, but you know what? No one is ever going to see that. Am I going to redo it? No, I am not. But here's another wave with no bubbles. This is sometimes what happens when you try and talk and quilt at the same time. You guys are way too sharp on the viewer's end. Way too sharp. I don't have my blue painter's tape anymore, so I'm trying to keep sort of a weather eye on that bottom edge and make sure that I'm keeping pretty consistent in the level of my waves. This is a little side note here on my bubbles. As I go around the bubble, there is this tiny overlap and kind of backtrack. I try to get that nice and accurate, but in practice, you know, far more bubbles is that less accurate than perfect. However, I think it's more important to focus on consistent size and shape. And then those little backtracks kind of don't show when they're less than perfect if the bubbles are all of pretty similar size. This is my two cents. And like I did at the top, I'm just gonna run back across and fill in partial waves as though the design continued right off the edge of the quilt. And then we're done quilting already. Just like that, a few lock stitches. Before we launch into the binding, I'm just gonna take a second to check my bobbin level. And we'll take some questions too. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have enough on there to do the binding, but you know what? I'm gonna grab something else that's just similar. Forgive me while I'm out of camera. Uh, the bobbin color that I used on the quilting was actually the same as what was on the top. Um, I should have talked about bobbin color a little bit. I do tend most often to use the same thread top and bottom. 
In the case of this quilt, the top is very aqua and the bottom is very burnt orange. But I didn't really want the burnt orange poking through on the top side, you know, to put burnt orange thread in the bobbin, so I just did the same, top and bottom. So now I've put, I think it's one shade darker of turquoise in the bottom, but it's not gonna show it all in the binding, right? Because it's gonna be entirely hidden. All right, a few things we need to do for the binding. It's all made. Sure, apparently there are a few questions. Let's do those first. Let me get my cup. I do have a little cup warmer today. It's way out of camera, so I have to run over there and grab it, but I do have a cup warmer. Erin, oh, it's Lorraine. Would you do this design on a very large quilt knowing that it's a little hard to keep straight or just reserve for shorter width quilts? I've done it on pretty big ones actually, Lorraine. That's where the blue painter's tape can come in super handy to keep your waves running levelly. Yeah, but it works. Or seam lines, whichever works to keep straight lines. Emily, do you ever use polyester about a half inch to make the quilting poof? I know other quilters who have Emily. I don't personally. I keep wool batting on hand, which is similar in that it's very fluffy and does the same, uh, the same result of making the quilting poofier or taking up excess fabric. So wool is what I go for because it's what I keep on hand. But I do know quilters who use polyester too. Lisa, I'll confess I'm a tinge jealous that your long arm has a needle threader. Oh, I know it is pretty nice. These old eyes ain't what they used to be. And it's pretty nice. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Margie, is this recorded? I missed the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Um, these always stay up on YouTube. We go back in the very, very beginning where I greet everybody. We trim that off, but the whole show is available for rewatching as many times as you like. Jennifer, I haven't attempted this pattern yet in the masterclass, and I figured that's exactly a mistake I would make. Good to know it looks just fine. So you mean the circles where I'm not exactly backtracking as I... Oh, the mist echo. The mist echo. Well, I mean, for starters, Jennifer, you're not talking and on camera while you're doing it, so your chances are better <laughs> than mine. But it's just not that big a deal, especially if it's a printed quilt. It's not the end of the world. Mary Rose, I've watched so many of your videos that the music plays in my head when I quilt. Okay, I love that. I love that. I'll pass that on to Dan. Every so often I think, ah, oh, we should maybe do some different music, but I still love it. Uh, dying to stitch, what length of corsage pins do you use? Oh gosh, I don't know if I know what length they are. They're a generous two inches. They must be two and a quarter, I would say. Mr. Producer says he'll measure them and post the measurement for you. Linda, will you share how you do the binding on your domestic machine, maybe on a different session? I've tried several binding techniques and haven't found one that I love. I actually already have, I think, two YouTube episodes, Linda, that show my machine binding from start to finish. So attaching it on one side, I usually attach it to the back at my domestic, roll it around and stitch it on the front. That's how I fully finish binding. And when I do it for clients, I attach it to the front. So I don't think I've got a client quilt necessarily on there, but the same principles hold true for mitering the corners, for joining the end, that sort of thing. Savannah, sometimes happens even when I'm not talking, haha, it amazes me how you hold your concentration while speaking with us. I try, Savannah, y you see, it doesn't always work, but I try. Claudia, beautiful pale blue thread. Can you please share the isocord number? Thanks, I sure can. It is... 4430. Okay, that's it for questions. Let's get set up for our binding. So this is the binding which Pris made and she cut it at two and a half inches and folded it in half. So I don't want to I don't want to pour too many details into your head, but this is one of the reasons I like doing mine at the domestic machine. I always cut my binding at two and a quarter, so I know exactly the seam allowance width that I want on my sewing machine. When you're doing it at the long arm and working with other people's bindings, those sometimes vary. People will do two inches, two and a quarter, two and a half, three inches sometimes for binding. The critical thing is when we go to stitch, you want your stitching line to be just under one third because you're going to stitch and then it's going to get folded over and folded again. And you want it to cover the line of stitching. So whatever your binding width is, you might need to get a ruler and measure whatever you need to do to make your stitch line be just under a third. And I'll show you my trick for that um, as we get going. 
You also want a ruler plate on your machine because you will be using a ruler. So on my machine, it just snaps on and off. That's different from machine to machine. And I'm using one of my favorite rulers, Quilter's Apothecary, because I love the handle and it's the eight inch straight. You see my blue painter's tape on here again. <laughs> what I did is I actually have several quilts for Pris and several bindings that are this size. So I've been doing them on the long arm and I figured out what that third of the spacing is. And I put a piece of blue painter's tape on here. So as I sew my binding now, that blue painter's tape is going to line up with the edge of the binding and my ruler foot is going to be against the ruler and it's going to drop my stitching right where I want it. So sometimes I don't have a magical way of, of like measuring just under a third. I just eyeball where that stitching needs to be, figure out where my ruler needs to be, and that piece of blue painter's tape is what works for me because it's not exactly on any of the measurements that are on my ruler. It's somewhere in between. So that painter's tape is another very great way to have a visual guide. So we've just left our quilt loaded. Nothing has changed. You don't have to trim anything up. I find it helpful to have the binding in a roll. A pile just gets unwieldy because we're gonna have to roll the quilt back and forth. That's up to you, but binding is sewn. All the ends are sewn together and it's folded in half and all this, the raw edges are gonna be at the outside edge of the quilt now. So I start usually on my lower edge and I leave oh, a good eight inch tail and then start stitching. And that tail is going to be what we use to join it later on. I think the split screen will be ideal here because I think you're going to want to see both. My bobbin is pulling funny. Let's go see what I did wrong there. I talk about this often, knowing your machine. When I pulled up that bobbin thread, it just didn't feel quite right. I don't see anything wrong, but I've just taken the bobbin out, put it back in because it didn't feel quite right is all. That's all I can say, it never was quite right. That's an old family saying, by the way, and it still isn't quite right, something's wrong. Let's see. Now I'll try a few other things. I'm gonna try pulling up a bobbin stitch off to the side where I can see it, whoops. Definitely was not right, because we now have a broken needle. Did we mention this is a live stream? Now I've dropped my bobbin and it has rolled somewhere. Hang on a sec while I go looking for that. Okay, it's gone. We're going for another bobbin. This is very, very live, you guys. Okay, let's grab another bobbin. And clearly I must not have had it firmly seated in there because the needle schwacked it. So that's my own fault. Probably just talking while I'm working again. So now you get to see a needle change. And by the way, I'm just using Schmetz Universal 9014 needles and I buy them in a box because they're very inexpensive that way. We're just gonna have to fiddle a little bit because the portion of the needle that broke off is in there and I can feel it. So bear with me while we figure this out. Okay, we got the top part of the needle. I'm just gonna flip the ruler plate off again so I can see better under here because that little portion of the needle that broke off is still in there somewhere. I can hear it rattling. And I have to be sure and get all those bits out part of it. Now it sounds smooth. Okay, I'm going to take my needle bits away. Bear with me again while I leave camera. I just don't want to leave those lay. Okay. This time I'll make sure I've got my bobbin in all the way. Snap. There we go. 
fresh needle in. I might add, by the way, this is another Bernina feature that I quite like. Other long arms may do it too, actually. Um, having the second hand wheel. So there's usually one up by the front of the machine where you can, you know, just advance or, or adjust the needle a little bit. But there's often one at the back of the machine too. And that back one is the one that is attached to the drive shaft. So if ever I get um, a bad thread tangle or something like that, that's where I would go um, if my needle's not wanting to turn. Because being attached to the drive shaft like that, it, it will turn. You can make it turn. So that's a good problem solver right there. Again, I'm struggling with threading the needle today. There we go. Okay, one stitch. There we go, and now it sounds right. Perseverance. Okay, there's a few questions about that whole process. Lay them on me. Okay. How often do you change your needles? Great question. A lot of quilters will say change a needle with every quilt. I honestly don't, especially when it's little quilts like this baby quilt, I don't feel there's a need to, but the very last quilt I did was one that had thick seam allowances and a lot of batik fabrics. So I knew that my needle was well worn and dull. So I actually did put a fresh one in this morning before we began. In reality, I only change when I, when I either hear the needle popping or it's not, you know, if I have skipped stitches, that's always my first go-to fresh needle. Um, but I don't change with every quilt. I just don't. Every two or three is probably more like Carrie, what was the discount code you have for Quilters Apothecary? Apothecary, again, thank you. It is SBS10, and it's in the description below this YouTube episode and most YouTube episodes, actually. There's a link there and then the code for you. Elaine, oh my gosh, I hope you have not caught my quilting nightmares. Can they be transmitted through the internet? I don't think so, Elaine. Please, no. <laughs> but, um, like, stuff like this happens. It just happens. So it's kind of nice when it does, honestly, on air. You guys get to see. This is not shocking. This is not horribly unusual. Stuff like this just does happen. Gail, do you have your machine set, and I'm sorry I missed part of that, to tie off when you end, or do you do it yourself, turn off the knotting? So my machine has the ability to, I have four toggle switches on my handles, and I can program them to do different things. And I have one of them programmed for a lock stitch. It does four quick stitches. So I hold that button down, one, two, three, four. A lot of machines will have options that you can choose how many stitches, if you want it to do it or not. That's all up to you. But my machine does have the availability, yes. And I quite like it. Do we have more questions? Catherine, this is why I love the live part of this. The unintended lessons are gold. Unintended lessons. That's a great way of putting it, Catherine. Yes. I have one more, actually. I have a couple more. Oh, a few more. Pat, do you ever use a magnet on your needle to see if it is straight? Well, Pat, I've done that in the past because most long arm machines have a round shank needle, and so you need a magnet or a pin or a something to align it. On the Berninas, they load just like a sewing machine and they use sewing machine flat back needles. So I no longer have to do that. It only goes in one way. That's how come I get to have a needle threader because the needle is always precisely the same. Oh yes, Mr. Producer is reminding me, maybe all of you, add your ruler plate. Phew, what would I do if you guys weren't here to keep me in line? Seriously, there we go, ruler plate. Okay, are we ready to stitch? <clears throat> There's a question about what you said about one third. I don't know what that means. There's a question about what I said about one third. So, so what I was talking about was determining where your stitch line is going to fall on this binding. Just knowing that you're going to stitch it in place on the quilt and then it's going to get folded back over on itself and then folded around the other side of the quilt. That's approximately thirds, right? And you want your first one to be a shy third so you've got room to get around that bulky edge of the quilt. Does that make sense? So just know that your first seam allowance attaching binding needs to be a shy third of the whole folded binding width. 
And this is to produce double fold binding, by the way. That kind of, I didn't say that specifically, but. Okay, so a few things, because it's been so long, you've probably forgotten. I'm leaving about an eight inch tail that will be used when I go to attach the, you know, when my binding comes all the way around and to attach the two ends together. And then I'm gonna start my stitching. And I'm eyeballing my approximate third to get started. If anything, I'll err on the small side because I'll, I can always stitch over it and make it a little bigger if I need to. Um, my blue tape is not in the right position. Hang on while I just adjust that. I thought, I really thought I was using that this morning and it was right, but it is, I don't know if I moved it. I don't know. I don't know what I did. But it's not right now. Where do we need it? Just above the half inch line. This just makes it so much easier to quickly see where that binding should be and quickly see where I should be stitching. Let's see if we got it right this time. Bingo. Okay. So now I'm just laying my binding out in front of me, a ways. It's a little quilt, so I can probably go all the way to the edge. When I sew at my sewing machine, I put the tiniest bit of tension on this binding as I sew. Certainly I don't want to ease it in at all because that's what gives you a wavy edge. So I'm making sure that it is absolutely smoothed out. Light on there. The raw edges are all lined up along here. And now I'm going to start stitching. This is where I say no special tools are necessary, just a straight ruler. I think that if you have an easy on off for your um, channel locks, if you have them on your machine, you could use them. If your basting is perfectly straight, you could just put that channel lock on and lay that binding in place and start stitching. I don't know, I, I'm a bit of a control freak. I like having my ruler and being able to make adjustments as I go. So that's just me. Okay, next detail. Again, much like if you were stitching at your domestic machine, whatever your seam allowance is from your stitching line to your raw edge, you want to stop that distance from the edge of the quilt. So I usually drop a pin in so I can see that because it's all too easy to stitch just a little too far. There are rulers that sort of do this calculation for you. Frankly, I eyeball it. That's just my way. So whatever this seam width is, that's how far I want to be from the edge of my quilt that I'm approaching. So now I'm gonna keep stitching to that edge. And when I get to my pin, I'm just gonna angle out toward the edge of the quilt. And I'm gonna go ahead and break thread. And I'm right at the front edge of how far I can stitch. So I got a kind of funky corner there. Keep my pin handy. Okay, can we see there? I think so. So again, much like you would do at your machine, I can't move it out of the way very far because you guys could not then see. Okay, I'm getting turned around here. This way, oh, I knew I was doing it wrong. Okay, folding it back. This way, is that helping? Okay, so I've folded my binding back. This is so important that you get your binding at a 90 degree angle to the edge of your quilt so it's not tilted this way or tilted that way, even a little. You will get the best mitered corner if you are really precise about this. So fold it back and then fold it over your quilt again. And here too, be as precise as you can. The fold now should be right along that raw edge. And I'm gonna drop a pin in there too to keep that all in place. I'm gonna try not to stitch over the pin. And I'm going to move my quilt just a little. Since I put the ruler plate on, I'm at the very front extreme edge of where I can stitch. So now what I'm going to do is start stitching right at these raw edges, put a few lock stitches in, and then continue up this side. So I want to, again, get my about third of this, shy third, where my stitching line will fall. And I, there may be a more precise way, 
but I just eyeball it and I err on the side of small because I'm going to go over it a time or two to lock stitch it so I can always add a little more once I get my ruler in place. So now it is locked in place. It can't go anywhere. I'll get my binding laid straight. I'll get my ruler in my hand. And I can see my blue painter's tape is overlapping so I'm just going to move over a little touch till I get it in place and then I'll start stitching again. And that is definitely too wide. Wow, I'm struggling with measurements, you guys. Really struggling. Okay, I gotta undo that. That is where my painter's tape is, but it is not quite right. Where do I wanna move, Lucy? Stella, down there? That was a little slip of the tongue. My last machine was named Lucy, and it still comes out sometimes. Okay, I'm gonna shift my tape yet again, because I feel like my seam allowance was just a little too big. Just a little. Let's have a look at this. Perfect. Okay, let's put a pin back in this corner. And really, you guys are getting the live and unscripted version, right? This, this is not a thing that I'm super duper proficient at. I just wanna show you that it can be done. And chances are, those of you who choose to do it oftener will get much more proficient than I am and probably have better tips to pass on. But I'm at least showing you that it can be done. That looks better. Now let's make sure we've got our binding laying straight along the edge. Again, I'm just lining up the raw edges. And I'm just gonna stitch about as far as I can in the throat space of my machine and then I'll roll it forward to keep on progressing right there. Move my ruler, move my seam ripper. And I should have put my needle down. That was silly. Okay, let's just quick break thread here. We have a comment. Is someone commiserating with all the oopses this morning? There's so many of them today. Okay. I'm seeing your Quilter's Apothecary screen. Okay, Elaine, oh my gosh, you are human. <laughs> I was thinking maybe AI. I'm very human, Elaine. Sometimes... Yeah, sometimes it's a little like eating humble pie. You're like, oh gosh, this is broadcast to a lot of people. But this, I mean, that's kind of the premise of this show. This is what it's really like in the quilting studio sometimes. Third time's the charm sometimes. We're just proceeding around the quilt now. And I'll show you each corner as I go through it. And it's just rinse and repeat, basically. There we go, stop with the needle down, got it. Because now I can just roll the quilts and it will just all come along. I even got the red snappers to roll under this time. They don't always go so smoothly. They did today. If I had a larger quilt, I would have had those clamps on for quilting, right? We talked about that earlier. I usually leave them off for this, just because you're not really going across the quilt. It's not really shifting. So when I'm stitching my binding um, up one side or, or down the other, um, I don't feel like I need the clamps to keep it stretched out, so. But I do, you know, shift my ruler foot till, till you know, you can see this is pushing in, right? So make sure it's straight. Your binding is still running straight. 
So again, I've dropped a pin in at the top corner. You probably can't see it yet, but you will in a moment. Same distance as my seam allowance. I've gone that distance from the edge of the quilt. And when I get there, I just angle my stitching off to the corner. Um, I don't think you have to do that, but I think you have to do either that or a lock stitching to keep that corner firmly in place. Then we'll fold out. And if in doubt, put a pin in here already. Like you can put a pin right on this straight edge of the quilt and it will help you know exactly where to fold it. I've done enough of these, I just, again, wing it. But I do make sure this fold is exactly 90 degrees. This fold is exactly on this outer edge of the binding. If you do it too long, your miter is gonna have too much fabric in it. If you do it too short, your miter is gonna look pulled and stretched, you won't have enough. So that's really key to getting a perfect miter. I do find this little eight inch ruler to be such a convenient length that maybe it has to do with my hand size, I don't know. But a ruler that's any longer, I can't hold the whole thing flat anyways. So this gives about as much space as I can stitch in one without shifting my hand, you know? So it works really well for me. Where did I set my pin? There it is. I'm gonna go ahead and pin my binding at the edge, which I know you probably can't see. I'm pinning it, which keeps it flat and smooth, and also, again, marks where my stitching line will end. Can you see the advantages to this, though, especially if you get more proficient than I am at it, in terms of, you know, not having to wrangle a quilt at your domestic machine? There is some real advantages to it. This side is the most tricky in terms of the ruler because it's really kind of backwards. Just take your time. Just take your time. Um, some quilters will swap hands. I find that my left hand is much better at holding a ruler than my right hand. So I just flip my hand to the other side of the ruler. And you could, by the way, put your ruler on this side. But in my experience, because that edge of the ruler, it, it's so close to the seam allowance, to the raw edge, it tends to let the binding or even push the binding off of straight. So in my experience, you've got to keep it on this fuller side. Just making sure my quilt's not pulling in at all because I don't have side clamps on it. Making sure all my thread tails are hanging off on the raw edges. I could take the time to trim them too, but they'll all get trimmed off when I trim up the quilt. But I don't want them to be between the binding and the quilt 
on the quilt side, if that makes sense. I want them to be out in the seam allowance so they do get trimmed off. And one more. So again, I'm going to grasp these leaders and clip them into place so that they're not pulling my quilt askew. Oh, there's my miscreant bob, and I see it on the floor now. <laughs> Where was it when I needed it? is bumping up against my red snappers which I don't have much excess on this backing so it's kind of nip and tuck here but we'll get it okay last corner you guys fold it out fold it back I have no idea if you're able to see what I'm doing or not, frankly. So from here, this is our fourth corner. And we're coming up on our splicing area where we would do that last splice. Now, Pris, when she made this binding, did do very nice um, um, 45 degrees seams so that that really reduces the bulk in the binding to have those angled seams and I much prefer that way and I like to do the same thing on the final join. I do have a friend who figured out a method for doing that whole seam at the long arm but it involved like having cardstock and, and making your binding extend over the edge and stitching that seam on the piece of cardstock and then pulling the paper off and then your seam was in place. Oh boy that just seemed like a ton of work to me. If you want to figure out a way to do that, be my guest. But my way of doing it is to stop at this point and then take it to my domestic machine to do the finishing up. So let's step back. Have we got the overhead view on? Yeah, we do. You can see that. So I've got my 8-inch tail that I left at the beginning. I've got leftover binding at this side. So I'm going to dismount my whole quilt. I probably will take it into my back room and trim it all too. Um, but you could do that before or after. But in either event, I'm going to take these two tails now and do a 45 degree angled mitered seam on that. And then I'll do that final little eight or so inches of stitching um, afterwards at my domestic machine. So that's my way of finishing it off. But you've seen now how relatively quick it was, even with all the accidents that happened to do this binding. It is beautifully square and beautifully flat. Um, there, there's... It really is a helpful tool. So whether, like I said, whether you've got shoulders that give you issues and you don't want to wrangle with a big quilt at your domestic machine or whether you maybe don't have space to get a whole quilt up and be working with the binding or whether you quilt for customers like I do and maybe this is a service that you want to offer, attaching the binding to the front. That's what's going to happen to this one. There's someone else that's going to fold it around and stitch it on the back. That's not my responsibility. I'm just getting it on the front. And so... It's a quick and easy way to do that. So, any more questions or comments about the binding? Before we go, let me get my coffee. Okay, Stella's out of the picture. Savannah, the one third seems that it would be dependent upon how thick the batting is. Is there something you do to decide on the one third? You know, for me, Savannah, I almost always do a quilt with 80-20 batting, so they're always very similar. If I had a double bat, I might go more towards a quarter of that distance than a third. But here's what I do when I'm doing it at my domestic machine. I sew a few inches of it, and then I reach behind my, my presser foot, and I fold the, the 
binding around and I see is there enough there to cover that seam? Is there enough there that I don't have to stretch or struggle with the seam allowance? And I make adjustments as need be there. On the long arm, you can't really measure that and make the adjustment. So my answer is to err a little bit on the side of a narrow seam allowance. Your binding might not be chock full, but at least you won't have to struggle with excess in there. Mary Ellen, what if the quilt isn't square? I always worry about that. Well, Mary Ellen, if you're using a ruler, you can pretty much adjust for that. Um, I, I did mention that if your quilt were perfectly square and if you did use the channel locks across the bottom and up the sides, you could stitch your binding on with those. Um, I tend to go with the ruler so that I can make little adjustments as I go. And so then it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if your quilt is a quarter or a half or even one inch off square. Your ruler just gives you a straight seam line is all. I'm not seeing the questions, Dave. Thank you. Nina, I love that you share it all with us, warts and all. I've gotten so much more pleasure out of my hobby when I realize that we all have warts. Oddly uncommon, nice to see the frustration and struggles as real life, not a stage set and perfectly edited video. So true. And honestly, you all are good for me too, because doing these YouTube episodes and getting your feedback on how encouraging that is, lets me know that it's okay to let the warts show too, right? Because sometimes we do. We want everything to look like it happened perfectly and it happened smoothly and there were no struggles and no tears. And sometimes they're there. That's just the way it is. So... Thank you for that. It works both ways. Doreen, did you shorten your stitch length to sew the binding on? I didn't, Doreen. I've got it set at 10 stitches per inch and that seemed small enough for me. I think that was fine. Like you, you saw me talk about um, in the mitered corners, I angled out and did those extra few stitches or you need to do a lock stitch regardless, I think, of your stitch length. But otherwise, I think 10 per inch is, is good. I've got just a tickle in my throat. It's just right there. Try not to cough in the microphone. Jeannie, how do you determine your quilt machine height? It looks very high in comparison to my machine. You know, mine is higher than most people's tends to be. I do think it's a matter of personal preference, but here's how I look at it. I do the type of quilting that you saw today, mostly. That's what I spend most of my time doing. So, so the all over, the edge to edge, the moving fairly quickly across a whole quilt. So I want my visibility to be good and I wanna be standing upright. So I have my frame set quite high and I did that on purpose. Those who do ruler work, for example, might appreciate a little bit lower machine because they're always putting pressure downward on ruler or those that um, maybe do very fine work, very close quilting might like, because I think I think the standard is when, you're, when your arm is at, your elbow's at 90 degree, angle that should be the height of your front rail and mine is definitely higher than that by two or three inches but that's my preference I tried it out with a few different heights until it felt good for me and you may have noticed I struggle with having bad posture when I'm at my machine I struggle with hunching into it so keeping my machine up helps with that and I'm always trying to work on that stand up a little more Terry how do you hold your scissors on the handle so my handle Terry has can we see this at all on Stella? If you do me from the side, Dave, you can see it. My handle has, this is adjustable here, and so it's got this little clamp with a, with a hole in it. Can you see that? So that's what happens to work for me. On other machines, I've actually attached a magnet somewhere, like maybe on the side up here, and just clapped my scissors up there. I've seen other quilters that have like magnetic magnets on their lapel, and put their scissors on there, whatever works. But mine is just fit into a little slot that my machine happens to have. Beverly, so can you tell us a rough estimate of the one third measurements? Well, on this binding, because it is two and a half inches, I would, well, I'm looking, I've got a ruler here. My seam allowance is a quarter of an inch plus about a 16th. Does that make sense? It's less than three eighths, but more than a quarter. That's what my seam allowance is on that binding. So that gives you a, an estimate for two and a half inch double fold binding. Madge, when you're done, can you show us the back and drive shaft? I'm not familiar with that. Sure, we'll try to. Mr. Producer is arranging a roving camera at the moment so we can show you that. 
Do we have more questions? Should we go to that one right now? Okay, that's the last question, so we'll show you that. I'll come around to the machine. So this is the drive shaft right here. So this hand wheel is attached to the drive shaft that's in the machine here. And so if I had a thread knot in there, this is how I can crank that drive shaft and I can put quite a bit of torque on it and it will loosen up any tangle threads that I've got. Okay. One more straight on one. Okay, let's recap a couple things before we go. These live and unscripted episodes, we do try and air twice a month. Um, today is the 1st of December that we're airing. We're going to do it again next week on the 8th of December, and we're hoping to come with a big exciting announcement on that day. Um, in my newsletter this week, I'll let you know what I'll be quilting and what the topics will be. I don't know that yet. These episodes usually are around a client quilt that I have in, so you can't always see really well on the fabric but that's it's more about seeing the big picture of a whole quilt being done than about a lesson on the specific quilting so whatever the client quilts happen to be that i have in when they have topics of interest that's what i bring to these live and unscripted shows if you're interested in supporting the show you can do that easily by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by susan as little as five dollars one time or if you wish you can contribute monthly and don't forget, if you need some easy listening, check out my podcast called Measure Twice, Cut Once. It is wherever podcasts are found. Podcast.stitchedbysusan.com will give you a bunch of choices for listening to that. Or it's also available on YouTube now. I'm gradually getting all the episodes uploaded there. Um, and there's a playlist called Podcast on YouTube. Do we have those photographs, Dave, that I sent you earlier? Okay, I got some photographs for you guys. One other thing that I wanted to mention. I do have a monthly subscription membership available. And I call it Advance. Not necessarily Advance, duh, but just Advance. Because you're advancing and it's a little bit of a play on advancing a quilt. And it's just, each month I deliver new content that has to do with um, often more custom quilting or I have guest presenters or I'll do case studies that are more behind the scenes detailed looks at some of the projects I'm working on. So today being the 1st of December, some new content is going out today. And I thought I would show you pictures of a couple of those things. Those of you that are in the membership, you'll get a sneak preview. And those of you who have not been in it yet, will see it. So one of them is parallel lines four ways. And this is one example of treating a quilt with parallel lines, but not necessarily straight parallel lines can be very useful if you're quilting in a domestic machine or if you don't have a channel lock. Other ways that you can do parallel lines. So that's one. Um, this is another example of parallel lines, um, in this case, very irregularly spaced. So the one lesson that's coming out is parallel lines four ways. So now you've seen two of them. And then the other lesson is a case study. And this is a custom quilt that I recently did for a client. And so I talk you through the process of designing what I was going to quilt on it. And then the step-by-step, -step how I marked it, what I quilted first, what I quilted second, how I stabilized the quilt, etc. So I call those case studies when they're kind of um, an in-depth look behind the scenes of a project that I'm working on for a client or for myself. So that's the new content in advance this month. And the way the membership works is your subscription gives you access to everything, to all the content that is in there. As long as you are a current member, you can view anything. And I just add to the pool of lessons each and every month. So you can find that on my website under the learning tab if you're interested in that. I think that's it for today. So we've quilted a baby quilt, we've put the binding on it, and it's off to my friend's mom, who's 90 something, and is gonna do the hand stitching on the binding. Isn't that fun? So these little quilts that go to the NICU have the care and love of a lot of people going into them. So a very rewarding project. Thanks you all for joining me, and I will see you again next week and in the next Live and Unscripted episode. Have a great day. Thank you.